Good. Thank you, Roland. I mean, um, really important for all that um, uh, was just read out about my past and my, um, my involvement with technology and, and, and things. Clearly, the most important thing in this industry is not having slides that auto advance, is, um, is you guys, people, the skills, and crucially, um, adaptability to changing conditions. So, um, yeah, I was actually talking to um, Simon from the Cybersecurity Council yesterday. The initiative there, um, again, you know, maybe sounds like it's another certificate, another thing to go through, no more exams, whatever. It's super important. I think it's really going to be valuable to help everybody work together. Maybe increase our bloody health. Uh, increase the, uh, I'll keep up with it, increase the um, half-life of a CISO uh, from 24 months to maybe actually being a thankful job that people want to do and, and appreciate. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the cybersecurity supply chain. And I'm going to try and pause that. The gentleman at the back, if you can pause it, then that would be handy, otherwise I'll just keep clicking. Um, in 2009, late in 2009, um, the, there was a guy called Behrouz posted a help, um, a help post on, um, uh, thank you, on a Siemens PLC forum asking for help with his Siemens motor control PLC. Totally confused. Is installing the same software, popped up, um, new install, CD-ROM, everything's great. Install from USB stick, kept on crashing, putting out weird error messages. The logging was failing, couldn't work out why. He'd run through everything you could think of, eventually last resort, posted for help on the internet, and, well, you know, as with most help chat things, went unanswered, eventually the chat was archived. Nothing happened. There were some people in the world who would have really hoped that that chat had been answered, because a few hundred miles away, there were some very confused nuclear engineers wondering why their centrifuges were failing at alarmingly high rates. Everything looked fine. Computers were fine. All the lights were green. All the data was good. But somehow, they were failing at rates of 20 25%. And nobody could quite work out why. By the time Stuxnet was, was discovered, and they actually worked out what was happening, around 900 nuclear gas centrifuges had been destroyed by this malware, which had been injected very quietly and very silently and very efficiently into the control systems that, um, that were used to enrich Iran's nuclear estate. And this was widely regarded as one of the first, certainly biggest, cybersecurity supply chain attacks that's ever been successful in, in cyber physical industry. Not the first, but the you know, first big one. Why is it important that it's a supply chain attack? Well, because for all that it was extremely impressive, four zero days deployed at once, that's not a, a trivial thing to do. Very complex, very clever, clearly very impressive. For all of that, there were some basic things that went wrong. People plugging USB sticks into sensitive computers. The biggest one was the assumption that once you're inside, everything's good. Yeah, the, the, the big issue was getting through the front door, getting through the Siemens PLCs. Once they'd done that, everything ran through the, through the facility perfectly happily, because you're through the front door, I'm happy, the data's good. And the crucial thing that actually kept the thing working meant that they couldn't see what was going on. For anybody who doesn't know the sort of physical details of Stuxnet, um, these drives and motors are supposed to spin pretty darn fast, um, and that's okay, they can deal with that, they're strong. Um, what they can't deal with is spinning really fast and then stopping, and then spinning really fast and then stopping roughly once every five seconds, and that's what was happening. The reason they didn't spot that and fix it was because all of the command systems were showing green, because the data coming off the motors themselves was being spoofed, replaced in the middle, and shown to the operator as, as all good. So. All through this, you've got people in the supply chain, you've got hardware in the supply chain, you've got third-party vulnerable vendors in the supply chain, and you've got data in the supply chain. <clears throat> and one of them, one of the things that we see um, 
most often is these bits of software. Actually, talking to um, somebody senior in the Linux Foundation recently, uh, it's a <coughs> kind of biased uh, view, I'm sure, but his view is that pretty much um, 85 to 90% of our network infrastructure software is actually open source stuff that people have found somewhere else. Not to say that it's bad, but it is to say that you need to know where you're getting it from. And I've looked up you know, Image Magic, again, not to pick on Siemens, not to pick on Image Magic, but Image Magic just happened to be what, um, what XKCD chose to, to pick on here. Uh, 700 CVEs in the MITRE database of the most popular image manipulation bit of software in the world. And I bet nobody who built that in in the early days was considering that they should take, a, take any notice of it or contribute to the upkeep or whatever. And unfortunately, you know, this carries on. So you know, Stuxnet, very, very clever. Four zero days, amazing. Right. Far other end of the spectrum. Guy, senior in the water industry, once told me a story from his early days where visibility was really, really important. They had a, a CISO who really wanted to see everything. Every single alert, every event, everything, want to get it written down, looked at, so that they've got this perfect visibility to present themselves. Now, this was back in the days of dot matrix printers. Um, so it was almost like a ticker tape. They had the thing in the control room, printing out every single time anything happened. Any red lights, any alerts, any unusual behavior, any time the security doors opened, any time the security gates were approached, everything. And you might imagine that the problem here that they had was too much information. They couldn't find the needle in the haystack. But no, they didn't get that far. So the problem with this approach, when they were looking for perfect information, trying to protect themselves more, that they inserted this really fancy logging and information system. But because it logged everything, you could attack this with a simple stick. So all you had to do as an attacker, or a red teamer in this case, they found it internally, but it's still fun, grab a stick and wave it through the security gate. It would generate an alert. Print a thing on the printer. Do it again. Print a thing on the printer. And if you do that enough, from enough sides with enough signals, it generated enough mechanical friction on their printer, frantically trying to keep up, that it generated smoke, it set off the fire alarms, and it opened the security doors on the sensitive areas of the facility with nothing more sophisticated than a stick. And I think we all know, also, if we're um, doing any kind of web testing, at least, where that story leads. Because in pursuit of greater visibility and in pursuit of logging and information, we have a very famous one of these, Log4j. People inserted this thing. They thought it was a great idea. It was best practice. Still is pretty much best practice to put Log4j in your application so that you can see what's going on. A lot of it's not security logging, but a lot of it was also security logging, going into seams and things like that. And then all of a sudden, overnight, everybody's vulnerable, and, and we lose. <coughs> um, and this little, um, whatever, Jenga stick analogy is not only a kind of fun temporary thing that happens when the news breaks. As of last week, just to pick a random example, you could go out anywhere, and I'm sure you guys find this in your engagements all the time. As of last week, 25, well, 23, actually, percent of all open public Minecraft game servers are still vulnerable to log for shell I mean, what the heck, right? So these things cast a very, very long shadow. So <clears throat> when we're talking about the cyber supply chain, um, what I want to make clear and I think I'm, I'm blessed to be in a room today with people who already know this, but lamentably, as, as Roland was saying, you know, to the outside world, to the people we're trying to protect, or the, the world that we're trying to lift, it's very unclear that the cyber supply chain is everywhere. It's not just for people in logistics. It's not just for people writing windows. Anything you do with computers that has software in it, or data in it, or personnel, or access control, any time you join two things together, that's a supply chain. And every one of those links could be the weak link. So something that always amuses me is when I'm planning a talk and something amazingly uh, relevant happens. Uh, this is MSI. Just a quick, does anybody, has anybody heard of MSI? Does anyone know why MSI is in the news this week? 
looks like a handful of hands, not many. So Intel Boot Guard. Intel Boot Guard is um, listed by Intel as being a technology to stop UEFI attacks. So to stop the sort of the bare fundamentals of your secure boot, your secure software, all of your configuration, all of your um, ultimately things like TPMs or disk encryption or you know, all the management stuff that people rely on and are asking us to test all the time to see if it's broken, fundamentally burned into the chip so it cannot be hacked, except it just was. How was it? Well, because actually Intel did nothing wrong. Intel made nice hardware that works with, with fuses that burn. It's really, really hard. So when you program this thing, it's not just software or files or data you're storing. You actually physically change the chip and burn the configuration and the public keys into it. Cannot ever be changed, not by nobody. They delivered that well. The problem is MSI, huge um, sort of supply chain middleman, they provide chips and subsystems to all kinds of other people like HP and Dell, all these big household names. MSI lost their private key. And because that private key is irrevocably burned into all of the hardware and the chips, that is preventing anything from, from going wrong, well now, there is an unfixable, massive hardware-enabled exploit at the UEFI boot level on an unknown number of devices in the supply chain, making its way through all kinds of industries. And the sad thing is that I could have put this slide in completely speculatively, knowing that no matter when I was giving this talk, I would have a story to tell. Because I could have given this talk a few weeks ago and it would have been Samsung's root keys. Samsung's root application store signing keys leaked in December. Same deal. Your phone is not your phone. In 2012, I was keynoting the AMD developer conference when they launched their hardware security um, extensions. I was working at ARM at the time, worked together, made a thing very similar to the boot guard with AMD. And by coincidence, as a subscriber to IEEE Spectrum, I had just, as I was leaving for Austin, on my doorstep arrived the IEEE Spectrum magazine for that month. And on the front cover was a, an article about counterfeit chips and how you can't trust even the hardware supply chain because, well, if you x-ray everything coming through, it was done by the US Air Force, actually, if you, and they started x-raying samples of chips coming into the, um, the Air Force supply chain, some proportion of them, not huge, but like 5%, which is enough, of those chips were actually counterfeit. And they didn't have proper lineage, proper provenance. Um, they had wires coming out of all sorts of places they shouldn't, um, whatever. Now, interestingly, the thing that we often lose sight of here is whether we're looking at malice or mistakes, whether we're looking at attacks or accidents. The thing with the US Air Force supply chain thing, for example, probably wasn't a tax, it was just money making. Because you could take these chips and refurbish them, and the reason they had wires coming out of them was because probably something had burned out and they needed to patch it. And they were just making, making money. It's not even necessarily an attack on memory or stealing secrets or trying to bring a plane down. It could simply be a, a, a running hours issue. The reason these things are refurbished and sold on the second market is because they don't have the expected lifetimes you need to keep a plane in the air. But nobody knew about it. So actually, the framing I think we need to take when we start looking at these things and when we're looking at the new skills and when we're looking at the certification development, when we're looking to align international standards on how we all do our jobs properly, is to um, really think about not just like, if I dare say, terrorists. You know, it's so common to have these kind of stories basically go down the terror nation state route. Criminals are a hell of a lot more common than terrorists. And accidents and people who don't know how to use computers are even more numerous than those. And what we really need to be looking at is starting to say, well, can we find places where fitness for use is also, is also a, a, an issue? Like some things not necessarily good or bad. Software isn't necessarily broken or perfect, but it has to do the job that it's supposed to be doing. And far too often what we find, um, even, I mean, gosh, how many stories, the blessed, um, the malware that took out the NHS, all the ransomware stuff, <clears throat> um, also took out things like charging um, terminals and the uh, ticket gates at railway stations and things, because it just ran all over the place. And that was definitely an attack, and I'm sure they were pleased to get the money, but they didn't intend it to go there. 
it just spread like wildfire because people have put all sorts of vulnerable versions of stuff in places where it shouldn't have been. So we always need to remember the mistakes are much more common than the attacks. Um, but of course, you can then use that to your advantage. A lot of enabled supply chain attacks actually happened because of somebody's mistake further down the line. <clears throat> part of this, part of the reason why this is um, possible is that we're just getting too much too fast. So I don't know how many of you consider yourselves primarily red or primarily blue or maybe, uh, I appreciate Roland's tie uh, for that purpose, um, or whether, you know, somewhere in between. But certainly um, for people in the sort of the C-suite or for people in the business protection or the safety side of things, often what we've tried to do, and we saw this with NIS, uh, I don't know how many of you work in the industrial side, but you know, NIS um, was, was big in the sort of industrial safety security crossover um, a little while ago. And we tried to fix all these problems with the traditional standard manual methods. So software comes in, we evaluate it, we review it, we check it, we deploy it, it's good. And then maybe they'll get a pen test and, and get it sorted. But you just can't do that anymore. The idea of having a, a quarterly gathering of the great and the good or having a kind of two-year lag on taking updates just doesn't work anymore with software. And, and it's always been a problem. When I was working in the, the aerospace space, so it's kind of an open secret and this constant needle in your side that you've got this big quandary. You can either be secure or you can be compliant. But every time anything has a kind of a fixed version number or a change management process, and you're going through CMM and you've got all your level four, but you're three patch levels behind and you know your network's completely undefended. It's like, what do you do? It's really hard. So getting ahead of this thing where the old practical, manual, reviewed stuff absolutely used to work and absolutely comes from a good place, but absolutely does not scale to today's challenge, is again going to be an important thing to move forward with uh, in these international standards and skills development and alignment, because we are not going backwards. Nobody's going to say, ah, oh, hold on, yeah, let's, let's not add uh, efficiency, let's not make our infrastructure greener, let's not make it cheaper. Yeah, we'll go back to the old days just in case. It's not going to happen. So we've got to meet the challenge as it comes. Not to mention, of course, um, the fact that I've only talked about software here and data itself also is coming far too fast for us to cope with. You know, a thing that um, uh, some people in... Uh, the, the voting sphere, I'm working with some people in voting right now, looking at um, the supply chain in, in votes past. It's a vast scale thing that you need to deal with. So we really need to come up with things that, that scale, that meet the common current um, approach to, to life and working and building systems, and not, um, not put up with, with what we've got today. So especially... This is a great video, by the way, just nothing to do with security, really, but it's just cool. Um, this uh, video is quite early deepfake, actually. It's before ChatGPT, um, a long time before ChatGPT, but a live deepfake video of this chap. Um, his real face isn't on there at all. He looks a bit like all of these people, which I think helps, but um, reciting a poem called Pity the Poor Impressionist um, in the voices of variously, you know, Robert De Niro, George W. Bush. And it's scarily good, actually. It's, it's, it's impressive, it's entertaining, but it's also really accurate. It does look like it's those people talking. It's certainly a better, effective bit of propaganda than just slowing down Janet Yellen a little bit to make her sound drunk, uh, which is a kind of cheaper trick that they pulled off at the same time. Um, AI content is going to make that torrent that we already have of software updates and information updates and configuration updates. It's just unimaginably fast and high volume now coming. Then again, it's important to remember that um, technology has no morality. So I was glad to hear Roland talking very positively about using things like ChatGPT and BurpGPT and things. So we can bring these things in to help us too rather than taking the approach that a lot of people have, which is, oh my God, like, let's shut off the taps, this is far too dangerous, we, we hate it. Um, 
we have a lot of uh, people asking us in my day job, a lot of people asking um, if we can like detect and stop AI content. And the problem with that is that AI content isn't on its own bad. A nice movie or a portrait of Charles and Camilla living it up with cocktails and cigars after the coronation as art is kind of admirable. It's nice. We like it. The exact same thing presented as fact or a news story, well, no, that's bad. We, we don't want to use it for that. But the point is, you know, there's nothing wrong with AI content. It can be used very positively for good. But it's important to know where it came from and what it's for and who gave it to you and why they did that. So, you know, given the speed and scale of software coming, of digitizing industry, of building everything really um, out of computers these days, and now adding the speed and scale of, of AI content, I do think we've got a bit of a problem. We've got used to it. Something that I, well, I won't even go there, but it, it bugs me, honestly, uh, in some ways, that we describe now red team, blue team, attack and defense, pen testing, whatever, kind of as an arms race. It's always we need to be like one step ahead, or at least no worse than one step behind the attackers. And it's always the same kind of stuff that's happening. It's all the same approaches. I'm sure you all, just like the Minecraft servers and the log4 shell, I'm sure you guys get so many jobs to do for so many companies that are exactly the same as the last, with exactly the same problems, with exactly the same kinds of issues. And it's not your fault. It's great that you find it. It's great that you help pick it up. But I think the industry as a whole has got used to this idea that, oh, it's just always broken and we'll kind of, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll live with it. Whereas actually, I think we need to be challenging that status quo. I think we need to have a new approach to bolstering the way we, as the good guys, are actually improving things. So, just. Why do I think that? Well, another famous um, quote from Mark Andreessen, uh, software is eating the world. We've got used to um, penetration testing type things basically being network attacks. We've got used to crypto type things being basically hardware security. Yeah, we, we've had some early wins. They're all good things. Right? I'm not, not down talking anything. Um, for where it came from, but we had some early wins in these areas and then stuck with it. And the problem is that now that software has eaten the world, and then APIs ate software, and then data ate APIs, yeah, nobody needs to write software anymore. You can make a lot of money these days without writing a single line of code. If you get the right data set and you have a smart insight into how to use that and market it to people, you win. So data now is king. And what we've done is we've got very good at authenticating people. And at some point, as we started to go into digital transformation and digital industry, we got very good at authenticating machines as well. We have got a bit good-ish at authenticating software. We've got a very long way to go on authenticating data. But I think this is where we need to go. Um, there is no putting the genie back in the bottle Information flowing between businesses, not people, not USB sticks, not software, but pure information now has the power to break things, has the power to kill, has the power to take down uh, infrastructure. And so knowing where stuff came from is super important. And if anybody sort of mind goes straight to digital signatures, things like that, yes, great, love digital signatures, but they're not enough. There's a reason why we have two-factor authentication for people. Because the password wasn't enough. Even if they've got a key, that key isn't enough. With devices, you always have two or three factors. So with data and information and processes flowing between businesses, you also need to have multiple points of provenance to really know where it came from, whether it's fit for use. It's fine to have a picture of Charles smoking a cigar with a martini in his hand, but you need to know where it came from and what it was for in order to use it. So. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Just in case anybody didn't think it was an issue, um, last year, 742% increase in supply chain-borne attacks. Um, and this is 
you know, last year after we started tracking this stuff in 2010 with Stuxnet. So this thing is accelerating. It's big, it's hard. Um, 1.2 billion vulnerable dependencies are downloaded every week. This is from generally GitHub, but you know, the other big open source places like NPM. So people knowingly download and start using stuff that is broken at this scale every week. And yet 96% are preventable. We know most people, the information is there to stop this from happening. It's just somehow not accessible. It's not working. It's not getting through to people. We don't know what's wrong with it, but it's, it's not happening because you could really make a huge difference overnight if people just used the information that was out there to their advantage. You know, honestly, we can do, we can do better. Um, and we actually are doing better. So I want to have a bit of a positive um, chat about this and, and talk about some new standards, some new techniques uh, that, are, that are coming out that I hope we can all use um, to, to actually make things better. Incidentally, the um, soup, does anybody know the, the, the soup connection? It's one of the early wins. There's always, you know, whenever we look at things and we think things are new and we start to talk about new developments, there was always something that happened 10 or 20 or 50 years before. Um, SOUP stands for Software of Unknown Provenance. Um, and to their great credit, the US um, medical uh, authorities have actually been tracking this kind of thing for a long time. They realized a long time ago that if they're going to certify devices, that they needed to know where all the stuff came from um, and actually have written into professional standards um, this thing called SOUP, uh, which was about 15 years ago, I think it was first in there. Um, recognizing that if you have software and you don't know where it came from, it's really bloody dangerous and you need to give it a second look. Um, so you know, we have, in small pockets, been doing better. The good news here is that we are now starting to do better at mass scale for the kind of people Roland was talking about, the ones who don't do this for the living, the ones who aren't researchers. They just need to keep their system safe. And this is all based on the power of provenance, knowing where stuff came from. So you can identify it properly, you can assess it properly, and you know when it shows up at your front door whether you want to let it in or not, whether it's a person or a hardware or a piece of software or, or data. You can do it. Um, all of the people that we would take our serious um, certifications from are backing this kind of approach. Um, so NIST, I mean, who knows? I don't like reading slides, so I won't. But you can see the, the logos on here. Um, all the people who set our regulations, who set the best practices, who give the certificates, who do things like Cyber Assure, are now focusing on these pretty much two tracks for keeping systems secure. You've got the, um, the provenance, knowing where stuff came from. Um, so it's sort of tracking your um, supply chain components in that way. Um, and this idea of zero trust. So making sure that if you put something down and you pick it up again, you check it again, because you can't be sure that your trust is still valid. You can't be sure that it's still secure. Um, crucially, the words that NCSC uses, which is probably most relevant to us here, is you, know, you have to assume all your internal systems are breached. So getting through the network, actually, again, it's an interesting point. I'd, I'd be more interested to hear you guys' opinion on it than, than say much myself. But it's really interesting that if people move to a zero trust approach properly, then penetrating the network border actually becomes very uninteresting because it's just assumed that's going to happen. And you need to get deeper and you need to work on the data layer and you need to work more on the social engineering and things like that to get back that position of, of, of attack. Um, <coughs> so, so what's happening? Yeah, just a basic <laughs> quip that I like to say, if, if, if nothing else, you know, don't put it in your mouth if you don't know where it's been. If you can't find out where your software comes from, who made it, what qualifications they had, whether they were any good, and if it's patched or not, don't put it in your systems. So um, what sort of things to look out for? So hopefully you know, some of you will know these and some of you, you won't. So the first thing that the US have done is to talk about software bill of materials. So they're looking to um, promote a, a culture of professionalism and transparency in the software that's created to say, well, you can't just give me a box anymore and promise it's good. If you give me the box, you've also got to tell me what's in it. And this, again, it's been brewing for a long time, but it was really accelerated by the log for shell thing. They got very shocked about that, because you wake up, you're a CISO, you wake up on the morning that news broke, and you say, right, tell me everything that's got log4j log in it. 
no bloody clue. Right? I can't find it. So even if you're the best team in the world, working for your company, trying to keep them safe, you know what you want to do, and you can't because you're waiting for a scared vendor to work out what their politically correct, commercially um, appropriate response is going to be to whether or not you're vulnerable. And you know that's going to take two days, and two days is too long. So the software bill of materials with a um, couple of open standards started out, um, and it's basically like a, a, an ingredient list. So it's quite good. It would tell you if you've got log4j in it. But just like with food, you know, getting the ingredients list is a lot of the journey. But also, if you're actually allergic to things, if you're actually a vulnerable or a critical organization in software terms, you also need to know where it was made and who made it. It is important that if your thing doesn't contain nuts but was made in a factory that contains nuts, that's still an issue. So software bill of materials is a good step in the right direction, but it doesn't quite have um, everything you wanted. Um, also including the fact that, of course, just like waving a stick through a security barrier, the um, software bill of materials can be used for bad as well as good. Some people really object to it because it gives you an attack map. If you can find the software bill of materials for a, a bit of critical software, you can actually work out which ones are vulnerable and how to attack them. Um, some of us would say that you could do that with Shodan anyway, um, but there you go. Um, and also, of course, you could be given a fake one because there's no guarantee that the ingredients list that you have matches the thing that you got through your front door. It's a bit like if any of you had the misfortune of eating the horse meat lasagna from uh, a few years ago. Same kind of deal. It's like there's no big guarantee. So nice step in the right direction, but we need to make it better, particularly because um, the way that was chosen to make sure you get the correct one and not a poisoned one or a spoofed one or whatever is to sign them with digital signatures. But as we all, I hope, know, simply signing doesn't help if hardware is compromised or people are compromised or CAs are compromised. You know, the, the entire Malaysian ID card uh, scheme was sunk by a sub-CA losing things. So they did everything right, they designed it right, they made them right, the hardware was good, and then somebody in the middle just screwed up and the whole thing, the whole thing died. So there is also certificate transparency. Um, certificate transparency started by Google, but it's a big collaborative effort. Again, you know, this, this issue of working together I think is super important because there's far too much work for us all to do on our own. There's certainly far too much work for us all to do the same work over and over again. And certificate transparency is a really nice collaborative effort to try and plug some of those holes in digital signatures and web PKI, where um, if a certificate kind of checks out, you get the green padlock on the site, whatever it might be, if the certificate checks out, but people know that it's broken for some reason, because it was signed by a bad sub-CA, or because something's leaked, or because somebody's just been bought by a foreign power that you don't like, um, it goes on this certificate transparency record. And this is where we start to get this second factor I was mentioning for sort of systems and data that you can actually say, yeah, sure, the certificate works, but actually there's something else wrong with it, so we're not going to trust it and we're going to move, move across. So urge you to look at certificate transparency, especially um, if in your day jobs you're, um, well, either way, defensive or attacking, but if, if you like to sort of get roots through going through spoof sub-CAs or exploiting X v3 extensions that are not honored in certain middleware, whatever other uh, vectors you like to use. Certificate of transparency is trying to plug those holes, and, and I think we should, we should help to plug those holes. <clears throat> oh, they, well, just I like, I like that thing that they have. Um, working together is, is a great thing, but also um, mistakenly issued certificates is a, is a great one. Um, because again, it just highlights the fact that we are not looking here for terrorists or even necessarily criminals. Simple mistakes in the very black and white, old-fashioned, hard world of cybersecurity could have massive, massive implications. And people didn't like to admit to mistakes because they have massive implications, and so they just perpetuate. And having safety nets like this and second factors like this um, not only makes the world safer, but also, I hope, um, and I would like to sort of inspire here, I hope makes people willing to admit mistakes more readily because we're working together as a community. There will be mistakes, but if we admit to them and we learn from them quickly and we patch them quickly, actually the whole world will be, will be better. So um, this is a, a really nice message and a, and a nice thing to get into. 
Then there's a thing called C2PA. Um, so this is um, probably the, in a way, the least and in a way the most relevant of the standards uh, to this audience. It's entirely about media files. It's about knowing where um, videos and images came from. It's the um, Content Protection Alliance, um, also with the, these, yeah, these guys. They're, they're basically the same. There's a, a Linux Foundation open standard, and then there's a, a community who are looking at making sure that you know exactly where things came from. Again, if you're reading a Facebook post and it says something about your current elections, you can choose whether to believe it or not. You can choose um, whether you agree with it or not, but it's probably nice to know where it came from. And if you're an intelligence agency or if you're a serious newspaper and you're going to print a picture, you really want to know where it came from. And what C2PA is, is doing, what CAI are doing, is starting to really gather together this idea that we, all of us, in so-called honest world, want to know where things came from. And if we're passing them around, if I give you something to put into your systems, if I'm a good actor, I will take responsibility for that. I will sign my name irrevocably to that thing saying, this is good, it is what I intended to give to you, and it is what you wanted. And if it turns out not to be, you can then stone cold prove that it came from me, and that I was lying, and that I'm a bad actor. And, and you have this kind of complete society now, or it's a model of a complete society, not just with the voluntary signing type stuff, um, but actually with obligation that says, yeah, I'm going to play and I'm going to be part of this, I'm going to do commerce with you, but I am responsible as my part of the supply chain in your operations. I am responsible for what I give to you and what I cause to happen later. So that's great, but it's still not quite enough. Um, partly because it's very voluntary, but also partly because of the technical mechanisms involved. So we are looking at things like um, signatures again. Ultimately, you end up with a PKI envelope, and those are very easily stripped. So for some use cases, it's great. If I want to say, I own this movie, put it out there, I own this movie. If somebody else then wants to use it, they can strip it off. And back to the AI topic, you know, a place where people are quite worried right now is uh, this idea of do not train. There are artists out there who really don't want AI to be learning from their pictures because they start to produce pictures that look like them in their style, that appeal to their audience, and now their livelihood is, is stolen. So they want to say, actually, tag their images that say, you can't use this. The problem is, if you tag it with something removable, then it gets removed and it'll end up there, and nobody knows where it came from, and nobody knows what they're going to do with it. So, to the rescue is a, a, an underlying layer, and this is the one that I'm the chair of, just to declare interest, but I'm the chair of it because I think it's great. I'm not promoting it because I'm the chair of it. Um, supply chain integrity, transparency, and trust is a very, very general purpose new <coughs> layer for the internet. There's a, a reason why we're doing it in IETF, where things like TCP and uh, TLS are, are, are developed a brand new layer that allows you to basically track the provenance of anything. So as opposed to those other things where you know, SBOMs know what software is, and C2PA knows what a video is, and is looking at the kind of exquisite intricacies of those, Git does not know what's in the box. It applies no morality to it whatsoever. But what it does allow you to do, in a very portable way, is to make these attestations of artifacts. So if I've got a bit of software, I make a single call to a notary service, and I get a transparent log of what's happened. So I can say, I've designed this software, I've built this software, I released this software, this version is official. It goes up there, and then anybody can check that. And when you say anybody, any tool can check that. So CICD systems, when things are coming in, can immediately check, is this the right version? Is it what they're meant to send me? Has it been modified on the way through, or subject to a man-in-the-middle attack? in an instant without worrying about attached metadata being spoofed. So the, the sub-CA stuff where you just re-sign bad software doesn't work in this approach because you've got the original attestation somewhere else. And this is a, you know, a, a, a really neat way also of working out the deep provenance because it's got a strong identity um, a component. Not only can you use it for things I've been talking about with the software, with the operation, the OPSEC type stuff, you can use it professionally in, in, in what you guys do. Because um, we do some work in the nuclear industry, tracking waste moving around. 
And one of the most important things they want to see is not just where did it move, but who did it. And not just who did it, but what qualifications they have to do it. It's called SQUEP, the suitably qualified and equipped person. Because even if they did the right thing and it ended up in the right place, if they don't have the right professional certificate, three steps down the line it will get rejected, it will cost £100,000 to rework and everybody's lost their weekend. So what you can uh, start to do in the security space with, with things like Skit is to actually share intelligence. Now, who wants to read the same threat report many times and turn it into sticks many times and send it into the tips many times? Why not do that once and work together and share the load, stamp all the stuff, put your credentials on the identity piece and then everybody can just automate these tools with the best available knowledge from a trustworthy, identifiable group of people that says, I'm going to use all of this stuff in my threat intelligence and my defense systems because I, can, I know where it came from and I know that the person it came from is qualified and on my side. So I would urge you, uh, in the true nature of um, first speech of the day, to think what you could do if you could trust your data. How much better you could red team, how much better you could blue team, uh, and actually, how much we could all do if we could trust everybody else's data, and exactly as Roland's saying, which I think is the most important message of the day, actually work together, combine our skills, combine our knowledge, combine the information we have as quickly as possible to not just be in that standard old-fashioned arms race, but actually challenge the status quo, move forward, do things a different way, and get back on the front footing. Um, so there you go. That's the, the, the challenge for the rest of the day, is to think about what we can all do as a community if only we could trust the data that's flying around. Okay.